Yes, perfectly. Yes, yeah. excellent. So the title sounds slightly different. It's called Collapse of Lagrangian Interval in Burgers Equation. It's slightly more specific than the title that I gave before, but it's basically the same stuff. So I'm very grateful to the organizers for inviting me. I would have been even more happier if I could have gone to Bangalore. Bangalore is kind of my third home and I would have loved to return there. But given that I couldn't, it's a pleasure to give the talk even online. And the talk has a strong Bangalore connection. This is done with Shaditra, which is, who is a student of Rahul. And the problem took me back to my PhD problem where I also studied Burger's equation, one of the problems I studied during PhD. So it all has a sense of nostalgia for me. Um, okay, so of course, the typical question to ask, maybe not to this audience, but normally the typical question to ask is why the Burger's equation? So J.M. Burgers invented the Burgers equation by taking the Navier-Stokes and dropping the pressure. So he had hoped that the problem would be still not completely without interest because he had kept the term that is nonlinear. So the other feature of Burgers is that it has a nonlinearity which is very similar to the Navier-Stokes nonlinearity. So from then on, Burgers has pay, played a role of being a test bed for various ideas in Navier-Stokes for a long time, particularly in one dimension. See, the problem with Navier-Stokes is that incompressible Navier-Stokes cannot be studied in one dimension because it's meaningless. On the other hand, incompressible, I mean, I'm sorry, on the other hand, Burgers is. So this allowed us to study the problem in great detail that Navier-Stokes we could not. So that's one advantage of studying Burgers. The second is the Burgers is connected, actually can be mapped in cosmology to what is called Zeldovich's adhesion model, which essentially describes the following. You have certain number of particles and the particles move and whenever they collide, they stick. So you can show that this dynamics is the dy dynamics of Burgers in the limit of viscosity going to zero. The other connection that Burgers has is with problems in condensed matter physics with the Carter parisi zhang or the KPZ equation, which is an equation that describes deposition of material on a surface. So if you look at a surface growth problem and assume that no overhangs are allowed, you typically get the KPZ equation. If you look at the gradient of the KPZ equation, it turns out that that satisfies the Burgers equation. In the limit of viscosity going to zero, the Burgers can be exactly solved by what is called the hoff pole transformation. It's a nonlinear transformation that maps Burgers into the heat equation. So these are all good things about Burgers. The bad thing is that it's not chaotic. An excellent review of this problem and application of Burgers to various problems in turbulence is in this Lejouch lecture by Uriel and Beck, Uriel and Jeremy. Um, I'm not giving a reference because if you search in Google, just saying Burgulence, this is the thing that appears at the top. Anyhow, so that's why Burgers connected to various different interesting problems and also can be solved in great detail. So then it acts kind of like a toy model for turbulence. The other problems in turbulence that it has a strong connection with is compressible turbulence. So a large number of us here have studied incompressible turbulence for a long time, but the astrophysicists worry a lot about compressible turbulence, particularly turbulence in the interstellar matter and so on. And compared to incompressible turbulence, compressible turbulence is a mess because depending on exactly what kind of equation of state you take, you can get a lot of different kinds of behavior. One of the models that you can use in compressible turbulence is actually the Burgers equation. So the main feature of this problem is essentially formation of shocks as I go into next. So this is just plain vanilla Burgers. You start Burgers with some initial condition. For example, over here, a picture taken from Uriel's book, uh, just a plain simple curve. And as time evolves, you can see 
in one of those things. So let's say you look here, okay? So you see a particle here is moving to the right with a positive velocity. And the particle here is moving to the left and they are going to collide. When they collide, they're going to form a shock. And that is the discontinuity or the shock that you find here. So that way a smooth velocity profile gets into a profile with shocks. And from then in the usual turbulence way, you will ask, for example, that what is the statistics of velocity difference across a length scale? Now, if it is coming from some initial deterministic velocity field, and it is following a deterministic equation which doesn't have chaos, statistic has no sense. So to introduce statistics or to make a closer connection to turbulence, either of the two problems are studied. One is to start with a random initial condition and the other is to keep adding a random force to the problem. Either way, let's say here we are talk, thinking about the decaying Burger's equation from a random initial condition. So you develop shocks and you also develop parts that are smooth. So now consider a velocity difference across a length scale r and the difference is delta u of r and you want to take it to the power p and do an averaging. This is the pth order structure function as you calculate in turbulence. You, I mean, in usual condensed matter, you calculate correlation functions. Here you calculate structure functions because structure functions are Galilean invariant. And when you look at the pth order structure function, you expect it to scale as r to the power some zeta p. So the, what does exponent zeta p's are, are the main statistical question in this problem. So if you now assume that this interval delta u is across a shock, then the velocity difference is independent of r. It's essentially the jump in the shock itself. So it's some constant v naught. If it doesn't, then for small r, you are essentially Taylor expandable. So delta u, the velocity difference is r. So you essentially get two contributions, one which is a constant v0 to the power p, and the another one which is r to the power p. But the first one that you have a shock within an interval of r actually grows with r. So the probability of having a shock within an interval of r is r. So that gives you a factor of r here. These two with two normalizing two weights by which you normalize would be your pth order structure function. Now, if you look in the limit r going to zero, then either one of these two is going to dominate depending on whether where p is less than one or greater than one. So you get zeta p versus p, a very simple behavior. So zeta p is equal to p for p less than one, and zeta p is equal to one for p greater than one with this point one being special. That's the usual plain one, vanilla Burgers behavior. So now to slightly more complicated Burgers. So this is Burgers with stochastic forcing. And the stochastic forcing is such that it is Gaussian, it is delta correlated in time, and it has a power law. It has a power law k to the power beta. And for all I'm going to do that beta is going to be negative. So this is something we had studied in a paper long time back. This is what something I did for my PhD. This was done with Uriel, Rahul, and Jeremy. Uh, so this picture on the top here shows a typical example of a velocity field. And this dashed line shows a typical example of the force. So the force is at much large scale. This structure has shocks everywhere. And how do you understand the behavior of this? It is also, to begin with, not complicated. So you say, look, what happens? when your interval contains a shock remains the same as what we talked about before. But it's the smooth part that's going to be different. So how do you understand the smooth part? There you use usual Kolmogorov-like behavior. So you look at the equation, you multiply it by u, and you calculate the energy flux. And you do it in a stationary state so that delta of u doesn't contribute. The flux term gives you something like u cube by r. And you are looking at a point where you take the limit viscosity going to zero for a fixed length scale. So this term also drops off. 
then you have a product of f and u. Now, the product of f and u, when the f is delta correlated, is essentially the ff correlator. And the ff correlated in real space goes as r to the power minus beta minus one, where the ff correlated in Fourier space goes as k to the beta. These are standard results. So from this, you see u cube by r goes as r to the minus beta minus one. And now if you make the ansatz that delta u goes as r to the power h with this scaling ansatz, you will get h equal to one third or in general, h equal to minus beta by three. So now you have two parts. One part gives you t by three and the other part gives you one, depending on whether you have a shock within your interval or don't. And just like what happened before, except the two straight lines are now different. Previously, the straight line had a slope of one and then it was straight. Now it has a slope of p by three and now it is straight. So that's the zeta p versus p plot. You see the theoretical curves here and you see the results from very careful numerical simulations done quite a long time back. And you see there is some mismatch over here some mismatch where the two straight lines should meet. Now, whether you should take that as a departure from the behavior and, and then get to the conclusion that the behavior here is truly multifractal, or you say this is certain, this appears as certain artifact and the problem is actually bifractal, that is a subtle discussion. I am not going into that at the moment, but that point we concluded that this is an artifact and I still agree with that. And the result are actually two straight lines and complete bifractal behavior. So that is the background of the problem. Now let's look at what's new. So let's look at this movie. In this movie, this is a movie done by Shaditro. You can see the Barger's velocity field changing with time. And he has also put a bunch of Lagrangian particle. So let's choose two of them. Let's say here and look at them. You see they're moving closer to each other. They're moving closer, closer. Now they're colliding and now they have merged into one. So you can imagine if I again start the movie from the beginning and look at some other interval. So let's say I look at the interval here, the distance between these two points that decreases, 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 and then goes to zero and the interval has collapsed. You see an example of that here also. Here we plot the particles in a space-time diagram. And then the distance to the nearest particle is put as a color. So in the beginning, you can see the distance to the nearest particle is kind of large. And as time progresses, the distance to the nearest particle decreases and it becomes quite small. So those are the cases where the distance to the nearest particle has collapsed to zero. If you blow up a small part of this, you can see this trajectories and you can see two trajectories which come and meet and then they go ahead and meet another particle and that's how the shock gets bigger and bigger. So one question that you can ask a straightforward one is to say, if I look at an interval of length L, then after a certain time, that interval of length L is going to disappear. So this is what we call Lagrangian collapse. So the time for the collapse to happen is some random variable. The time is random, of course. Now we want to know what is the statistics of this time and how does the statistics depend on the length of the interval we started with? That's the main question that I'm going to address here. And what we are going to show is that the statistics of this time is very non-trivial. It's far from Gaussian. And we can essentially construct the complete PDF, well, up to the dominant terms. And we can also calculate the scaling of the moments of the PDF from various arguments that we construct. And these arguments are very similar to the plain vanilla Burgers arguments of straddling a shock or not straddling a shock. Okay, so then I will get to the main part. So any questions so far? No, great. So let's see. So if I sorry, now look- Sorry, Druba, can I ask you a question? Uh, 
of course, the statistics of these times will depend also on the forcing, or or there absolutely. is some uh, absolutely. Okay. There is every reason to think so, and that will also come out from what I am going to do next. But we have done the simulations for only one value of beta. Okay, thank you. And why that value of beta? Because that value of beta is h equal to one third, which looks like Kolmogorov, which is then something we like. But there is another better reason is that it is for this value of beta that we did our very large simulation before. So we know the equal time behavior at that beta extremely well. We do not know that for all values of beta. But is there a cutoff in the forcing? There is, is there a cutoff a in the forcing, cutoff? yes. Yes, good, excellent, thank you. So can I go back? Yes. See, essentially, this forcing k to the minus beta, if continued to the smallest scale, that's going to interfere with the natural dynamics of the Burger's equation, which is particles colliding and merging. So we cut it off so that in the inner part, there are at least six, I think it is six, it could also be eight, there are at least six points where the for which forcing doesn't interfere with. So that's why this very, very small structure of the shocks are uninterfered by the presence of the force. Okay. Thank you, Shomriddhi. Anything else? Okay, let me go ahead. So now let's look at three different cases. The first case, which I call case A, is the simplest one. So Think of a typical snapshot of velocity and think of two Lagrangian points, one on one side of the shock and the other on the other side. Okay, the distance between this is R. It should not be RL, the L is a typo, but don't worry about that. Uh, so look at this interval and that is the interval at T equal to zero. At T equal to tau, that interval has collapsed. So tau is the interval collapse time in this particular case of an interval of length r. So you can say that look the, let's say let's look at the interval and then the velocity on the left is ux and the velocity on the right is ux plus y. And then the difference between the, in the velocity between these two particles is going to determine the fate of the interval. So if the length of the interval is r, dr dt is the difference of velocity across the interval, which let's say is delta u. I can integrate this equation to find out the time. So the time, the typical time for an interval of length r is r to zero dy by delta u of y. Now for this delta u, what should I choose? As I am, have an interval, which includes a region which has just one shock, the velocity across this interval, delta u is independent of r. So it's just a constant. So the tau should be r by some constant. So, but the probability to obtain that is a probability that is proportional to r itself, as I had described before. So from this scenario, we get one contribution to the time scale, which is r by v naught to the power p, because it's the pth order time, multiplied by r, which gives me an exponent of r to the p plus one. And this is what I call case A. So next, case B. So here, initially, the interval doesn't contain any shock. That basically means the way the two particles can collapse is that there is some point at later time when a shocks form within the interval. And eventually, these two particles will be absorbed within in this shock. So this shock can form, for example, at very short times. It can also form at quite late times and the shock forms and the two particles collapse into the shock. So it is the second scenario that we consider now that the time at which the shock forms T star is very close to the collapse time. So what would happen in such a case? In that case, you can see that the dynamics during most of the time till the collapse is going to be determined by the smooth part of the velocity. So the time scale tau is delta dy by delta u of y, where the delta u of y, we now take the smooth part, which is r to the one minus h, 
I'm sorry, which is R to the H integrated from R to zero gives R to the one minus H. So adding that to the contribution, we get R to the P times one minus H for the Pth order contribution. So this is the case I call B1. Next, I again consider an interval. And for this interval, there are no shocks in the beginning inside, but this collapse into a shock at a time, the shock forms quite early. So the shock need not actually form inside the interval. It can also be on outside the interval, but capture one side of the interval, okay? So let's say the shock forms at T equal to T star. And by that time, the interval has already decreased to a smaller length R1, okay? So initially it is R. At T equal to T star, the interval has collapsed it hasn't collapsed, but it has length has decreased to R1. And the T equal to tau, the whole thing has disappeared. So if you are at T equal to T star, when the interval has become R, the rest of the scenario is just like the scenario A before where you have a shock. And before that, you have a behavior, which is exactly the scenario you have when you don't have a shock. So if you take that into account, use the same arguments, so let's say we first find out what is the tau. So tau is the same thing integrated from R to zero. And then the first shock forms at T star when it is R1. After that, it's going to behave like the scenario of A, where basically means the time taken is going to be R1 by V0. So from this, I can calculate, I can obtain this relationship. And if I expand that in, in a power series. And from that, I can find out R1, substitute that back here. And after some algebra, I get tau is proportional to T star minus some constant times R. So this contribution also gives something proportional to R for this case. So there are three cases that we have considered. One goes as R to the P plus one. One goes as R to the P times one minus H. And the one goes as R and they will all come with different weights. Sorry, <clears throat> yes. can I ask a question? Yes. Um, but uh, I mean, maybe it's simply just because I have not much confidence with bug equations. Couldn't be that your distance is such that you have more than one shock inside yes. the interval. Yes, 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 thank you. That's, <laughs> that's absolutely the right question to ask. Um, See, in the limit of R going to zero, see, eventually all of this will look in the limit R going to zero, right? That's the dominant scaling. Okay. So then you will only have one shock in the interval, except if the shocks are fractally spaced. That is not the case in this problem because we know that's another reason why we stay in this beta is that because we know that you get the equal time exponent by exactly the same argument. You remember the same argument that we used to derive the equal time exponents. There also you can ask what happens if there are more than one shock, right? Okay. okay. And that's the same answer is that if the shocks are not fractally distributed, then in the limit of R going to zero, you will have one shock because the shocks are basically isolated structures. They are not correlated with each other. Was that? Okay, I, I see, I see. Indeed, the, the usual uh, way to do the scaling is that zero dimension for the shocks and so on. So yes. otherwise you'd have the shocks are zero okay. dimension. I but see. if the position of the shocks are on a fractal set, then the problem changes. I see. And uh, Druba, just for, uh, uh, to, to add on this, uh, because this is correlated to correlate this, there is a question on the, on the chat yes. which, which asks, what does it mean for the shock to be fractally distributed? So maybe you can uh, add the oh. two comments on this. If the positions of the shocks are, for example, on a Cantor set, that would be shocks that are fractally correlated. I have never seen such a case. But when something like that happens, then you have to be careful with these arguments. But we have never seen that. I have never seen that happening. Maybe Shomridhi has better experience. I don't think he has seen it happening either. Okay, thank you a lot. There is some other question on the chat. No, 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 he's a, he's a thank you for the previous question. So it's okay, Excellent. You, can, you can go on, sorry. Excellent, no, no, no problem, thank you. 
Okay. So with all these three contribution, we again take the limit R going to zero. Sorry, sorry again. There is a, there is another question by Klaus. Yes. Could you explain collapse once more? Could you could you explain yes. once more the collapse? Absolutely. Thank you. So if I just go back a few steps, so look at this movie for example. We have released certain. We have just marked certain points in the flow, and these points are Lagrangian tracers that move. And the shocks form when two particles collide. So when two particles collide, the distance between the particle at t equal to zero has collapsed to zero. So this is the collapse time. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So collapse is leading to, to shock, but collapse it's just one moment shock. in the shock, basically, when the shock starts or something. Yes, and you can okay, think thanks. of it That's another good. way that if you think of an interval, and when a shock forms, then all the material in the interval has been collapsed into that shock in one point, basically. Okay, thanks. Okay, so the result at the moment is that we have three contributions, which goes as three different powers of R. Now in the limit of R going to zero, which one dominates depends on which P it is, but this is not a complicated one. And you find out that this time scale, which now goes as R to the power some ZP collapse is two P by three for P less than equal to three by two and one for P greater than equal to three by two. So this is our numerical result. And you can see the quality is as good as what we had in our equal time results. There is a mismatch here and we can discuss that mismatch why we also understand that roughly with the same arguments that we understood the artifact in the equal time case, but I would rather not talk about it immediately. So with that, now I have first result. The collapse time is a random variable and the PDF is not a Gaussian. Why not a Gaussian? Because if it had been a Gaussian, then all this exponent you should be able to obtain from just the second order exponent, which is not the case here. So the moment scale in a non-trivial manner, so that's about the moments. Now, of course, if you have all the moments, you can just calculate the PDF. But I will show you for a moment how the PDF appears from very similar arguments. Was there a question? No, no, no. no. Okay. okay, so I, if I remember correctly, Stephen Hawking said once that his publisher told him about the brief history of time book that every equation you put, you will lose certain number of authors, a certain number of readers, which means certain amount of money. But then a general corollary of that is every equation you put in a slide, you will lose certain number of audience. But this is after all center for theoretical sciences. So I guess every equation I put, my number of audience increases. So given that this has a slide, which is only full of equations. So, I want to calculate the probability distribution of tau. And I say the probability distribution of tau depends on the probability distribution of V naught, which is the velocity of a single Lagrangian particle. So of just by the rules of probability, phi of tau is probability distribution of V naught multiplied by D V naught D tau. Now, what about the P of V naught? In turbulence, the single point velocity is Gaussian. It's Gaussian in usual homogeneous isotropic turbulence. It's also Gaussian in burgers. As far as we know, to the best of our knowledge, it has also has a proof by Polyakov and some other people uh, for certain cases. I don't think that's true for every beta, but I think it is still true in our case. I mean, our numerics shows that it is true. I don't know if there is an analytical proof. Uh, with that, let's start. So if I consider the case A, then again, the typical velocity V naught, the way it is related to intervals is just R by tau, because again, I'm considering an interval that contains a shock. So the velocity across the interval is independent of the interval length, but the probability of having the interval is R. And from that you get a term, which is R square by tau square exponential minus R square by twice tau square. So this term you can imagine gives you a dynamical exponent of one. The case B where 
we had a shock very much near the collapse with the same ideas give me a different expression. This is R to the one minus H by tau square. So you get a dynamic exponent of one minus H by two. Case three gives something far more complicated and I am not going to look at it in great detail. That's why I have hidden all of that over there. So at the end, I get two expressions. One is two third by tau square multiplied by an exponential. The other is R squared by tau square multiplied by an exponential. I mean, both the cases, it's basically a Gaussian. Exponent, well, no, it's exponential of R to the power something. So we check this directly. And to you, you know very well that checking PDFs from simulations is a very, very difficult thing to do because there are binning errors, particularly in the tail of the PDFs. So what we do is that from the PDF, we calculate the cumulative PDF. And then you can look at the cumulative PDF at short time and at late time, and you get two expression. It turns out both these expressions have the same dynamic exponent, but the actual PDF has, of course, not one, but at least two dynamic exponents. So this we check against our simulations and the results are not bad. So one of the, the left one is at short times. And one of the things it shows is that various data should collapse when the thing is plotted in tau by r to the two third, which is exactly what we see here. The inset shows you how it was before the collapse. And in the main plot, you see how they are after the collapse and it is quite decent. So to summarize, at the end, what we obtain is that the PDF has a power law tail, which you get here. And there is not one, but at least three dynamic exponents in the PDF. But remember, this is only the dominant contribution. There are also subdominant contribution, which we haven't looked at. And there is no, so what does it mean by having three dynamic exponents? It means that there is no simple dynamic scaling. So if you think of the same PDF in the diffusion equation, then if you scale your time, say scale your x by square root of t, then all your PDFs at different times will collapse and you have a dynamic exponent of half. But over here, there is no one dynamic scaling exponent that will make the whole PDF collapse. This is what we call dynamic multiscaling. Massimo, how long time do I have? Let me check. So you have uh... 10, 10, 12 minutes, and then we have uh, questions. Excellent. Okay for you? Excellent. Yes. Good. Mm -hmm. So now for you, I have also put some Latin in the slide. Uh, now, given that we are talking about dynamic multiscaling, let me tell you what it is. So this is something I have said many, many times to many, many different audiences and gone hoarse telling it. Um, it essentially means that if you ask the question, what is the lifetime of an AD of size R? The answer is, what do you exactly mean by a lifetime? Time scales defined in different way will scale differently. There is no one dynamic scaling exponent. The dynamic scaling depends on how exactly the times are defined. And that also means that different moments will have different scaling exponents. This is exactly what we found in the Burger's case. In some other words, the PDF of time scales will not show simple scaling, which is exactly again what we find. So this is typical behavior of turbulence, at least from the multifractal model. This is the direct consequence of the multifractal model. But in this case, you see, we haven't used the multifractal model. In this case, we have derived it based on the basic dynamics of the Burger's equation with exactly the same kind of arguments that has been always used to find out the scaling equal time scaling behavior of the Burger's equation. Now, there are also more conventional way of looking at time scales of turbulence. So one of the ways, for example, is to construct something which you can say is a pth order time dependent structure function. Okay, that's quite a mouthful. So let me just describe to you what it is. So you take a velocity difference, difference between x to r at time t0. And you look at the velocity difference between the same x by the same scale r, but at a different time t0 plus t. 
take the second term to the p minus one, multiply and do an averaging. So divide it by the sp of r, which is the same quantity in the limit t going to zero. And you will get something which is only a function of time, function of the time t. So essentially you are looking at p velocities with only one time difference between them and with only one length scale between them. But because there are p velocities, there are many, many scaling behavior that are possible. For example, you can say, I will look at this function, which is fp of r and t. Now, of course, this function has to go to zero as t goes to infinity. And it is one at t equal to zero, the way it is normalized. So it has the typical behavior of a time correlation function. And you can say, I integrate it from zero to infinity, ignore the mistake here. I integrate it from zero to infinity over time t. And there is another mistake. This should be multiplied by a t to the power p. And then I can have many, many different time scales, each of which I can call an integral time scale. In a similar way, I can define many, many different time scales from this same function. I'm not going to do that now, but just for this integral time scale, it scales as r to the power some exponent. Because it is pth order, I call it chi p. And because it comes from the integral, I put the label i here. So, this is look quite strange, but believe me, you need all of that. Uh, I am not going into how you find out this expression from the multifractal model. Just touch on it a little bit. So if you do a multifractal description of the same quantity of this pth order correlation function, then you have an integral over the weights of the multifractal multiplied by L by L to the power some function of H. Essentially, H is the scaling exponent of each fractal set within the multifractal. And for each of them, you have a characteristic decay behavior, which given by this G of T by tau. Now this time scale tau, you can say, depends on H. So this time scale is different depending on which part of the multifractal set you are dealing with. Once you do that, it typically goes as L to the one minus H. You can put that here, do the integration, get a time scale, and you will find out that this chi P is related to the equal time exponent by a relation like this. This kind of relations are typically called bridge relations. So this is something we had derived, again, something I derived in my PhD a long time back, and I'm happy to revisit it for Bargers. And the credit of doing it for Bargatz is all Shaditros. He has worked extremely hard on this very difficult problem numerically and analytically. And what you obtain from these two is that the chi p of i now has this behavior. So essentially the zeta p's are the bifractal zeta p's of Bargatz. And the chi p is now, okay, it has basically three pieces, not a big deal. Okay, so far so good. This is an example on the left of the correlation functions I was talking about. So they are one at t equal to zero and at t going to infinity, they go to zero. Now, if you have calculated correlation functions numerically, particularly for a problem in turbulence, you know that it is extremely difficult, devilishly terrible to be able to calculate its behavior as very large t. So the integral that we were doing in the previous step going from zero to infinity I should better cut it off somewhere, okay? Now is going to happen something very, very strange. So I cut it off at very short times. So I cut it off over this range, which is shaded by this pink color. And from that, I obtain the chi p's. And these are the chi p's that I plot here. You see the theoretical prediction has three pieces and our numerical numbers are quite close. They don't look so close. They may not look so close to you now, uh, but if you work on this problem for a year, they will look very close. Um, on the other hand, these are the error bars on the problem. And you see there are these jumps where these lines meet. And the reason for these jumps are the same as the equal time one. So I really have nothing to complain over there. But now if you change the time to a later time, something very strange happens. 
all of this interesting behavior disappears. The only dynamic exponent you have is z equal to one. Okay, that should give you pause and it did. And then if you are like us, you would say, oh, we need to use the quasi Lagrangian description. And most other people would say, what the hell is a quasi Lagrangian? So the quasi Lagrangian description of a velocity field was invented by Belliniker and Lvov, I think in a paper in JETP in 88, where they said that, look, it is well known that if you try to deal with the Navier-Stokes equation in the Eulerian frame, and if you try to do a field theory of the system, there are infrared blowups in the problem. And this is something which is also sometimes called the sweeping effect. It can be understood in what is called Taylor hypothesis in a very simple way. So Eulerian measurement means you sit in one point and look at the flow going past you. So if there is some large scale velocity, which is making the small scale eddies going past you, then the decorrelation, the time decorrelation that you see is because of this small eddies being swept by the large eddies. Then you can imagine that the time and space are just linearly related and your exponent is unity. This is what we have landed up with at late times. So what Belenikar and Lumov said, and they showed, but um, we have to revisit that with certain things, as I will tell you now. Uh, what they showed is that if you try to now construct a field theory, but this time, instead of doing a Lagrangian behavior, Eulerian behavior, follow one Lagrangian tracer and look at the velocity field with respect to that Lagrangian tracer. Once you do that, the sweeping divergence is removed and your field theory is well behaved. So this is something we know how to do in numerics. We have been doing it before. And in this case, this doesn't help. The plot in the middle is exactly the same correlation calculated for the quasi Lagrangian times. And you find that at times they also give z equal to one. So the quasi Lagrangian not helping us is what is a major surprise in this problem. In this, I should mention there is a very, there is a quite an old paper by Hayo and Jayaprakash, paper not frequently cited, but it's a beautiful paper. And we have, I have at least found the use of it many, many times. What they show here is kind of the argue starting from essentially Carmen Howarth kind of construction that if you now look at S2, which is their second order structure function, which has both a time level and a space level. Their second order structure function is defined not exactly like our second order structure function. I'm not going into the details now. The bottom line is, if you now look at S2, which is depends on R and tau, a length scale and a time scale, at R equal to zero and look at its dependence on tau, you will get an exponent of zeta two by z. Uh, sorry if I interrupt you, Druba. There is a, 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 sorry, Jeremy? a hand. Uh, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy is. Yes. is, uh, is... Please. Yes. Hi, Druba. So, so I Hi. had a question concerning your, your quasi Lagrangian stuff in burgers. Uh, at the end, you will finish, you will end up in shocks. Yes. So, so which means that, that, that the, it's, it doesn't make much sense to do quasi Lagrangian because. The velocity exactly, field is but, but, of but, your position. But, no? but, but you are spoiling my suspense. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I'm absolutely right. You are absolutely right. So don't listen to Jeremy. Wait for the suspense. Don't Coming watch back. my movies with Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Coming back. So what the what Hayo and Jayaprakash showed is that if you look at this S2, it should behave scale with time as tau to the some zeta two by z. And if z is one, this exponent would be two third. And it is a plot from their paper. You see that at late times, you actually get a two third. At short time, you see something that could have been different. Okay, so the fact that at late times, we essentially get the sweeping behavior has been seen before in this paper by Hayo and Jayaprakash. 
Now the Kwasi Lagrangian was supposed to be different, but as Jeremy says, the most important thing is the trapping in the shocks, which makes the Kwasi Lagrangian useless. So this also may be why this Kwasi Lagrangian trick will not work in compressible turbulence in general. So now I have at the end of the story. Uh, so what we have showed is the statistics of the collapse time shows dynamic multiscaling. We derive this by the analytical arguments and support of numerical simulations. The usual dynamic multiscaling ideas also work, but at short times and for Eulerian velocities and also for quasi-Lagrangian velocities at short times, that's not a surprise, but not at late times because exactly the trapping problem. Now, there are many questions that this may give rise to. For example, you can ask, how does the collapse time behave in higher dimension? That becomes a very interesting problem. Should you look at how for example, in two dimension, should you look at how lengths collapse or should you look at how triangles collapse? So it should be area or it should be length. In 3D, should you look at tetrahedrals and how tetrahedral collapse to zero? So these are whole set of interesting questions that Shaditra is looking at and he already made some progress. So if you are in Bangalore, seek him out. Uh, and then the question is what happens in actual compressible turbulence? And these are also kind of problem that we are studying using something called the pencil code. But then if I start talking about the pencil code, I will take another hour. So let me stop now. Thank you very much for your time. And I'm ready for more questions. Thanks a lot, Druba. Very nice, uh, very clear talk. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Jeremy, you rise again? Yes. So, Jeremy has a yes. question. Yes. Yeah, so, so, sorry for spoiling. I didn't no, 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 no problem. <laughs> uh, could, could it be that your quasi Lagrangian stuff works when, when you consider uh, 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 shocks which are more distributed, uh, like, like fractal shocks you are, you are talking about? So, which would mean that for, for lesser values of, of beta? I, yeah, this I don't know. Of course, I don't know. Otherwise, I would have told it. But absolutely, the different values of beta are very interesting. I, you remember, I had in 20 years back, I had data on that, but we never wrote something. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Maybe we should look back at that. Other questions? I have a question. So yes. you, maybe I missed it, but I mean, it seems to me that you, you haven't... Massimo, I missed you. Uh, explained us well uh, um, the origin of the spurious uh, of the spurious uh, scaling. Uh, right, at least that I haven't I, understood that I the origin. Yeah. That uh, I did. Yeah. So can, can so, you maybe spend two words on that? Yes. So that mostly comes from subleading corrections to the scaling. Mm. So you can, if you go, if you work a little bit harder and try to calculate what are the subleading contribution to the scaling, you find that they come with a different sign. And ah, that- Okay, this problem of cancellations, okay. Yes, and this is something there is, Luca also wrote a paper on this roughly the same time we wrote our artifact paper. I don't mm -hmm. know if you were there in the paper too. Yeah, yeah, but I didn't yes. remember the origin of uh, of this previous uh, case in your, uh, in your now 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 that you tell me, I remember. It's, it's yes, it's a subleading term. Yes, I mean, yes, yes, as, yes, yes. Now remember, yes. As as usual in scaling, the devil is always in the subleading term. Yes, it's, it's very subleading. similar to the to the the trouble we had with the saturation of D two. Yes. For for the yes, initial part. Yes, yes. Now remember, yes. Now remember. Okay. But Jeremy and uh, Druba, because uh, you the thick. Wouldn't, uh, if it was the subleading, wouldn't something like ESS wash it out if you carefully choose the uh, third order of something? That is or? a possibility we didn't consider. Maybe there is a clever ESS possible. At that least, would be interesting. At least one of the gaps can be closed, uh, either the IR or the UD. That, that is interesting. We didn't think of that then. To, to do what, Samridi? Can you repeat what you were suggesting? Uh, using extended self-similarity because yeah. if it's a correction which even comes with opposite, so, you know, the IR sure. and the UBN will have opposite signs, presumably, if one can yeah, be Yes, yes, I, 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 no, I, 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 I,
do ESS with eyes open. Mm -hmm. But, but so, usually one is using ESS in order to, to, to get rid of, of border effects. So basically yes. to get rid of the small but, scale or large scale effects. So here it's different because it's it's that you have two powers which are very close to each other. <clears throat> yes. So yeah, normally this case is not going to work. But do we have an estimate about the coefficient? No, we don't, right? Just we can we can try. Normal ESS is not going to work, but something clever. No, not normal. Not normal, yes. You may be able to devise something clever. There are other uh, questions or comments? No, just a quick comment. You didn't want to say anything, anything more about higher dimensions? No, I am not. You can. Okay. <laughs> just to, because the results exist already, actually, the generalization has to do with collapse of triangles. And then if you look at the details, triangles can collapse in three different ways. And they lead to three different exponents. But to make a long story short, it is still at least numerically multi-scaling slash, slash bifractal, but we can't do the theory very well in 2D as we can in anything. And I think it generalizes in a straightforward way to 3D also. You just need more data and patience, et cetera. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So. Uh, we have time for uh, another one or two questions, if uh, if any. If if not, I will just ask a curiosity. Uh, so if you if if you look at the, uh, I mean, shocks will sooner or later will collide and form other shocks, right? Yes. Okay. So. Uh, I mean, can you think of it like a genealogical uh, uh, tree and study, for example, the, the statistics of the time or between ancestors or stuff like that has been done already? I don't know if uh, but there is a lot of um, uh, interesting studies on, uh, on this kind of problem in, uh, in um, genetics. Uh, good, good point. I think for he, he, there is the Kingman, Kingman, if you can remember, uh, collections theory and stuff like that. I think they, they Massimo, could suggest. I, uh, Massimo, I am just going to write that down. Can you say that again, please? Uh, I, I will send an email because I have to check the name. <laughs> okay, so I, I will uh, just, I just one sorry question. So, so basically, we have done some stuff in this direction with Kostya Hanin. Mm -hmm. uh, so back in the in the early two uh, thousands. And, and, and it, but it was for the case beta equal to zero. Okay. Which means that it's, it's a, a forcing which is white noise in space. Brava Mosh, okay. Yes. And, so, yeah. and, 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 then, and then what we get is that in this uh, uh, lifetime uh, uh, merger, et cetera, of trees, uh, or I mean, you, have the, you can have dual view with the La 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 Lacrangian uh, uh, tracers. So basically you, you, what, what you have is, is that you get a scaling which is the same as in KPC. Okay. Okay. So, so it's a. Uh, there may have been. He said this paper from 2002 or, uh, or 2001. There, there are also decaying Burgers paper, maybe even before, right? Yes, for the decay, it's different. Yes. Maybe uh, maybe yes. Uriel yeah. Massimo, Massimo Vargasola Ma, and Massimo Uriel and Ella Nule and. Yeah. This. This sounds okay. like. A, Thank you. 